Welcome to the MSDW Podcast. I'm Jason Gumpert, editor at msdynamicsworld.com. And today I'm pleased to have two guests on the podcast, uh, Mark Smith and Steve Mordew, and two names that many of you probably know. And today they represent Power ISV, a new initiative that they are launching along with some other partners. And um, what we're here to talk about, Power ISV, uh, the Power uh, Platform itself, uh, and maybe some other things that are going on in the space. Uh, well, first, let me welcome Mark Smith. He's someone who um, I've been following for a long time, but really have never met uh, until now. I imagine many of our listeners know you, but Mark, welcome to uh, to the podcast. Thanks for joining me here. Excellent. Thanks, Jason. Good to be here. Yeah. And and Steve, uh, welcome to you as well. Glad to have you back as always. Yeah, I'm an old hat now. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, you can just wander in any time at this point. <laughs> um, and uh, Mark, for those of you who maybe for those people who maybe don't know you, um, I mean, you you do um, so much great content in the in the Microsoft community among you know among the other work that you do. Can you can you just say a little bit about about who you are and what you do? Sure. So uh, I'm also known as the NZ365 guy, uh, and that came about because Mark Smith is just such a common name that I couldn't stand out from the crowd. So, um, yeah, went with NZ365 Guy. I do quite a bit of podcasting um, on the Microsoft Business Applications podcast. Uh, I've run some uh, small practices, dynamics practices, as in boutique. I've started up my own companies in that space, and then I've also run very large um, uh, practices that span multiple countries. Um, over my 15 plus years now in the dynamic space. So yeah, it's been a great, great ride. Excellent. And uh, so together, the, the two of you, in addition to, I guess, three other partners um, at this point, um, have started a new firm, Power ISV. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a firm, uh, really, where it's more of a collaboration mm-hmm. of MVPs, um, which is distinct from an actual firm. Um, you know, it's really just a, a, a blanket name over uh, five MVPs that, that really are focused on the ISV space and, you know, trying to, to make our collective knowledge available to other ISVs to be able to succeed on a platform. Yeah, it, it, it makes a lot of sense in, in, the, in terms of what the need is. But, yeah, maybe we can understand a little more, more about what, what some of the goals are and, and, and why it came about. Um, from my perspective, clearly there is uh, an opportunity right now, I think, for uh, Microsoft partners or companies looking to get into the Microsoft channel to to really grab onto the Power Platform, um, especially, I would say, Power Apps, uh, maybe as a, as a focal point, perhaps, and you, you could tell me otherwise, but um, and, and make that a component of how they want to build out uh, a business opportunity in the Microsoft space with my, talking to Microsoft-based customers or bringing customers into the Microsoft uh, technology stack. Um, and uh, it seems like a pretty uh, straightforward opportunity in some ways, but it probably has its own set of challenges. You know, I think that's really kind of what created the opportunity for us to to think about this was the release of the platform license. Uh, kind of opened up uh, Power Platform for a whole new kind of ISV and to com- combine that with the changes to the platform itself and the unified interface uh, coming out that also create a lot of challenges for existing ISVs and uh, I together with the other guys and Microsoft have long really wanted to get some of those Salesforce ISVs to come over and I think we're we're at a tipping point now where you know they're looking seriously at the at the platform and so we just saw an opportunity to you know, let's see if we can you know help foster all that stuff along. So modernizing existing ISVs, uh, helping brand new ISVs, and uh, helping Salesforce ISVs you know add another platform to their portfolio. Um, when you do talk to these kinds of companies, um, Mark, where do you where do you find that these conversations start? Are, are people approaching it from lots of different? angles or do you kind of hear the same questions over and over so so often what it is you know a company has had an idea let's say they've been working on a project let's say they're an si to start with a system integrator and they have developed some ip over time and they go hey why don't we become an isv why don't we build this once and you know sell it multiple times 
And so that's kind of like one stream of kind of ISVs coming. And then the the other one you have are ones that have purely seen an opportunity gap in the market and uh, they may have some kind of industry-related IP and decide I'm going to – I need to choose a platform to actually build the software on. And so, you know, when they look at platforms out there, they may look at, you know, uh, AWS is one of those choices or, you know, Microsoft. Then when you look inside Microsoft, you know, three cloud environments to work with. And if it's a business-related app, you know, it, the, the Power Platform is kind of that location that they want to sit. But, of course, once that decision's made, it uncovers a whole bunch of other decisions, like how do you work with Microsoft in, in taking your product to the cloud? How do you, how, how do you find your first customers? Uh, you're in a global marketplace now. How do you support customers from geographies all around the world in different time zones? You know, um, how do you work with partners? Like, are they your competitor or are they somebody to enhance your go-to-market story? So, yeah, they come they come from all kind of backgrounds and they've kind of got different drivers and they generally have their at different levels of their process and they need help, uh, uh, you know, in any one of their go-to-market type strat, like even how to go to market, how to, how, you know, how do you, as I say, engage or sell through partners, sell through Microsoft? How do you, how do you get into app source? You know, is what's the value of app source? Can I take my product in there? What's that journey look like? Um, you know, when I first created our uh, ISV products back in, heck, it would have been back in about 2008. Uh, you know, you had to go through a full uh, lion bridge to do a software validation, etc. Microsoft bought a lot of that in house, or, or if you like, uh, seemingly in house. And how they they do that qualification now, it's a bit more rigorous. Um, every time you make a change to code, there needs to be an update or a re- validation that is carried out. And so. Um, what happens is ISV, you know, generally, as I say, start with this idea, but they don't realize that there's a lot of moving parts to execute on to actually get their product to market and then turn it into a sustainable story. One of the biggest challenges I imagine for anyone, you know, doing this kind of evaluation is is trying to track how, how Microsoft's actually progressing with any of these, the elements of what you'd call the power platform and how those changes are going to then, uh, you know, trickle back to the decisions that, that the ISV has to make about, well, I guess yeah, on the technical side, on the, the partnership side, on, you know, you know the platform and, and technical choices they have to make. Those things seem to be moving pretty quickly. And, and to, to that, in that sense, I guess it does make a lot of sense to have have people like you to be able to call on um, to kind of get a sense of where those are at. I mean, just even uh, just even in the last week, um, Steve, you reported on some changes. You know, for example, I think with what was it the with uh, with the way maybe Microsoft's going to sort of you know manage uh, its approach to App Source, um, which is I guess one component that that really does play into an ISV's decisions. Um, and, yeah, I mean, and there's probably others too, right? We're we're pretty heavily engaged with all of the ISV folks at Microsoft. They're they're big proponents of what we're doing, and you know as MVPs we kind of have a little bit of an unfair advantage because we get you know a lot of information early in the cycle, and uh, so we have a chance to kind of digest that and understand what it means. And you know part of our jobs as MVPs is staying on the front edge of what's happening, and so to be able to to kind of you know work with ISVs and make sure they're going down the right path, not an old path, make sure they're pointed in the right direction, get them connected with the right people at Microsoft. Um, We're working with the ISV teams on the whole ISV story to make it better, uh, remove friction, remove hurdles, Uh, and it's going to be a journey. I mean, the worst worst thing that I, I sometimes here is when ISVs just make the wrong bet or they, they take things in, in a direction that then doesn't, that they maybe don't realize and then six months or a year or even longer down the road, they realize they've painted themselves into some kind of a corner or gone you know, down a tunnel with no end to it and they have to back themselves out and, and maybe at great cost. Um, Mark, is that something that you've uh, uh, you know seen companies, a mistake you've seen companies make? So, 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 you know, probably one of the, the biggest mistakes I see being made is constant investment in developing something that hasn't yet been validated, uh, that it has a market. Um, so if you like, there's this constant process of designing or adding new features to a product 
where you haven't even, if you like, sold the old features. In other words, you don't have, you haven't reached critical mass yet in your sales. And it's kind of like this constant tinkering of your brilliant idea is ultimately, you know, um, burning a hole in kind of your um, your pocket, if you like, isn't if you if you haven't got funding or something like that around it. So that's that's what I, I, I'm typically seeing. And then others that uh, the other common one I see is people building on what they think is the current version of Dynamics or the Power Platform, and so they are you know, creating, thinking they're creating this amazing experience and not realizing that the actual UI you're using is now, you know, the classic experience. It's been deprecated and they're trying to make stuff work in that, if you like, environment, not realizing that there's actually a whole new way just because they don't have the, if you like, you know, what Steve was saying, that cutting edge exposure to what's happening and what's coming and what the thinking is behind those changes. And so, you know, that's where we, we offer a lot of value to kind of, you know, make sure those dev cycles are not burnt on creating something that's irrelevant. That's interesting. I, I, yeah, and, you know, I, I, I get quite a few press releases, or uh, you know, kind of day in, day out, and I still get some that are, I think, new. Someone wrote it, you know, in the last few weeks, and it still, you know, uh, references dynamic CRM uh, integration and, and, you know, where I guess companies just aren't, aren't sort of attuned to how the product has changed in the last, you know, three, four years. Um, it still happens. So what are, maybe what are some of those um, technologies that maybe already or, or aren't really things you can count on yet? Can you, can you note any right now that people might be thinking about? You know, I think there's a few things. There's, there's kind of where the platform is at this moment in time. And then there's where we know it will be in the very near future, which you should be thinking about while you're building today. And then there's where we uh, think it will be a little farther down the road that you need to keep in mind. And this is this is to your point of not building yourself into a corner. It's really just having your head up and, and looking out ahead. And you know, I've written much about uh, the, the the partners and SIs that are that are not not up to speed with where things are at. And imagine an ISV who's not even familiar with the platform, just having really no clue where to start. And you could very easily start down a path on your own, uh, you know, down, down a dead end path or something, as Mark said, is deprecated. And, uh, or, and we do see that a lot. I mean, I, Mark made a great point because I see that a lot with ISVs where they, you know, they get this idea that they think it's just brilliant and they just have their head down and they keep building and building and building and building. and. You know, part of Mark's job is to ask them that question: Why? Why are you building this? Who wants it? You know, wh why are you? You know, who's your customer? Uh, before they've spent, uh, hopefully, any money, uh, because once you know who that customer is, um, you know, I think that 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 kind of dictates what you need to build and at what pace. And in the space we're in today, since it's moving so quickly, the deeper you build the higher risk you are at having to rebuild on a continuous basis to keep the thing current. And I see lots of ISVs building from scratch uh, technologies that just exist. I mean, they're already there. You can, you can plug into flow to solve that problem. You didn't need to build that. And it's just a matter of them not knowing all of the components that are out there and available to them and, uh, you know, just sticking their developer hat on and, and, and coding away on stuff that's, you know, a click away. So I think it's a lot more efficient to build today than it ever was, uh, to really be able to build a robust application and use all the components that are available as long as you're aware of them and understand you know, how they work together. One area that seems to me to have a lot of promise, and you, you can tell me if you think this is sort of too, uh, ready for prime time or, or still early days, but um, is the idea for, I, for ISVs of building connectors in either to flow, to... Um, Common to common data service, so that they can kind of tr start getting their data in there for use in other in other ways downstream. Um, are those uh... that yeah that falls under George Binsky's uh, category of working mm -hmm. with ISVs who want to build connectors, and connectors are are going to be a huge part. They already are a huge part. Microsoft built a bunch of connectors early on, and has now turned that over to ISVs to build your own, and that kind of fits into the. You know, the, the ISV, they've, they've created some taxonomy now, uh, real high level, uh, build, which refers to people that are building on the platform without first-party apps, 
extend, which is kind of the traditional ISVs we're familiar with that are extending the first party apps with, uh, with other items, and then connect, which connect is really about that connector side where you are a, a, a solution out there, think, uh, you know, DocuSign or one of those kind of solutions out there that you want to plug into Microsoft, and that's where connectors can come into play. And uh, connectors aren't something that you can monetize. They're really something designed for, for somebody like a DocuSign to build a connector uh, to make it available for people to use in a flow or a Canvas app or anything else in the future that, that's going to utilize connectors. So that, that's going to be a big space for that connect um, uh, part of the taxonomy. Yeah, and and is that are those classifications um – are those have those been around for a while? Or are those brand new? I saw that you you wrote about them, and and we can link that up. Um, but uh, has that evolved, or, or what? Those were so uh, the ISV uh, for Dynamics for business applications has now been, been taken over by Steve Guggenheimer Googs, and uh, you know he's a veteran of Microsoft. He's been involved in you know lots of uh, lots of different initiatives over the years and he's coming into this thing and, and just looking at it fresh and so the very first thing he did was to kind of develop this high level taxonomy i think just to kind of categorize isvs a little bit cuz isvs a pretty big term and i i first heard it announced at the uh, PAC meetings last week. Um, i don't know if it had been out uh, before that but that was one of the key things he wanted to layout in the very first conversation he had with us was this high level taxonomy just to help people understand which bucket they're in and for you know for power isv it's great for us to kind of figure out which bucket somebody fits in because that'll help us a lot with knowing what kind of help they're going to need well two of them are traditional yeah, right oh sorry mark go ahead so so and it's important i think a lot of people don't understand and, and particularly that build phase there that if they've come from a background of Dynamics, that they need to use Dynamics as part of that story, where really now what we're seeing is companies going, you know, we're not, we're not going to touch Dynamics at all, mm -hmm. or those first-party apps. We're not going to necessarily extend sales or extend customer service. We're seeing, you know, companies have a, a, an interest in, like, what Steve's done there, where he's built a full standalone application on the Power Platform. So, in other words, you get all the functionality that the first party apps have to build really any kind of line of business application. And I think that's where the big opportunity is. You know, there's always going to be the ability to extend, of course, for first party apps to some degree. Um, but, but I think the big opportunity is to take the core platform, you know, it's got a, a very modern user experience um, uh, across the top of it and really build from the ground up. And, and I say only from the ground up because the beauty of the platform is all that underlying infrastructure that every bit of software needs, whether it's security, whether it's scalability, uh, whether it's the connection services, APIs, et cetera, that's all there. And it really allows, you know, the imagination and the business opportunity to be validated and build any type of industry application now in a highly scalable, highly distributable um, platform. Yeah, I think a lot of folks are going to be looking at their solutions the same way we looked at Rapid Start. You know, we originally had built Rapid Start on top of the first party sales application as a tool to bring it down to make it simpler to use. And one of the challenges for that was that we were behind a you know minimum $95 license. Um, so before I could even get any revenue for, for our solution, you know, a customer had to be prepared to pay at least 95 bucks a user to get the first party app that we sat on top of. And when we moved that underneath the first party apps and built it on the platform alone, you know, now it sits on a $40 license, does the exact same thing it did before. And I think there's a lot of ISVs that will be looking at their, their application that they built to run on top of first party app, because up until recently, that's the only choice you had, and looking for those dependencies that they have to that first party app, and really studying the value of those dependencies, whether they're necessary or whether they can, you know, build underneath that first-party app and just lower that hill uh, to customers using their IP. And, and once you do that, I think part of what we're trying to help people understand is what does that mean to build under the first-party instead of on top of it? Because uh, first-party apps, there's a lot of stuff in there. And, uh, you know, when you're not taking advantage of the first-party apps, 
Um, there's a lot of things that then you need to consider building. There's limits, uh, restrictions, uh, certain restrictions in place that you have to understand uh, what you can build and where you can build. And I think that's the that's kind of the area where it's gray right now for people to navigate. And I think where we're seeing, you know, the people looking for the most help is to navigate from, you know, sitting on top of that first party to now maybe sitting under it. Steve, do you, do you think those restrictions are going to persist as in this concept of, you know, certain entity types can't be touched and, you know, we know they're being protected by folks in the first party app type team where the, the whole platform story is this brand new story. Um, do you think there's going to be kind of that lockout long term of specific entities when the whole idea of the common data model is this open model that everybody can engage and work with? Um, or is it only open till you touch something that they don't want you to touch? You know, I think there's two factions right now inside of the of the group uh, and, and have their own vested interest in both sides. Uh, and I think ultimately, uh, if I were placing a bet, I'd place the bet that the platform is going to be wide open and that all those restrictions will be removed and the first party applications will compete with third party applications for, you know, who's got the best application on the platform. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's ultimately where, where it will go and needs to go uh, to really to really blow up. Um, and I, I know there's people inside at, at high levels that are championing that uh, that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think they'll ultimately prevail. But as of today, it's not there yet. So today you still got to navigate. Um, but I think that those those restrictions are going to go are going to fall by the wayside pretty soon. I, I would agree, uh, Steve. From what I've I've seen, it sounds like the prevailing um, view at Microsoft is consumption, right? And the, making the case that they don't want uh, cloud consumption or, or you know apps built using certain business types doesn't sound like a, a an argument that's going to win out. At the company overall, I can see, uh, like you said, certain factions supporting that, but it's hard to see that standing up over over time. If uh, you know, if if other partners want to come in and build great great solutions that that overlap, you know, if you imagine that they snapped their fingers and started all over again today from the beginning with what they have today, they probably would not have built any apps. They would have just built the platform and relied on. You know, ISVs and other people to use the platform to build apps, but here we are. You know, we're we're what many many years into first-party applications out there in the wild. And many customers dependent on them, and so that it really can't just go that other direction. But that doesn't mean they can't let that other direction flourish underneath and see where it goes. I think it'll put uh, you know it'll put some pressure on the first-party app teams to to really think about you know what they're building and how they're building. I think the challenge for the first party apps is, you know, they were never uh, vertically designed. They were they were a Swiss army knife, uh, fit any business, which means fit no business. So every customer has to invest a significant amount of money, um, you know, to, to, to modify those first party apps to fit their specific needs. I think the opportunity on the platform really is for those vertical solution uh, providers that understand a vertical very well Maybe they have customized the first-party apps uh, many times to meet vertical requirements, and uh, just to build a vertically specific application on the platform instead of using the first party. And I think that's a that's a huge wide open market because you know, Microsoft is never going to. Well, I don't say never, but I, I don't see Microsoft ever getting into building you know deep vertical applications. It's not a space they've ever said they wanted to get into. And uh, I think, you know, when you look as a customer comparing, you know, a first party sales app to something designed specifically built for their industry and their business, still customizable, all the customizable, you know, capabilities that a lot of other fixed line of business apps out there don't have, uh, the integration with Office and all those other things, I think it's a, I think it's a pretty powerful story. The, and then there's the uh, there's the other side of it, which is I think there's some there's some comfort maybe psychologically or maybe just in terms of the way partners are used to working of that idea of building on top. Um, and there's just such a vast um, what pool of of solutions out there that are already built that way, um, and and that probably are most easily upgraded to stay on top of the first party apps. Um, so I, I just would you say though that that. Uh, 
approach is going to persist for um, for the and that's, that's, future? that's definitely going to vary from from ISV to ISV. Mm -hmm. No doubt, there is a lot of stuff that comes in the toolbox when you add a first party application that does not exist on the platform by itself. And to the degree that you need and utilize and want to utilize a lot of those things in that toolbox, you know, building on top of the first party is going to be the way to go. You know, you got to offset the, the difference in license cost uh, to development cost uh, and, and do the math to see what makes sense. Um, you know, as opposed to rebuild a bunch of components that exist in the first party uh, application, uh, you know, you got you to weigh those costs. And that's, that's, that's really more of a math uh, decision, I think. And it's also kind of the, the market the ISV is going after. So let's say they're building a product that's designed to um, come along behind, if you like, or, and make advancements on a first-party app. That, in, in, in other words, they're targeting a customer base that's already on Dynamics, as an example. They're not targeting a, um, a Greenfield customer that has never heard of Dynamics before, but they're targeting pre-existing installs. Um, I think it's a no-brainer because, you know, if you like, the platform has been proven um, or Dynamics has been proven to that customer already. They're not trying to sell the story of Microsoft um, in there. But for the ISV that kind of creates, you know, um, uh, a, a piece of technology to run, you know, uh, uh, let's say a, a laundry business, as an example, that, you know, they know the laundry business inside, outside, uh, you know, upside down, the, you know, they have commercial customers, that type of thing. Um, and they, these customers don't necessarily, you know, have a Microsoft footprint yet or an appetite or, or even heard of Dynamics. There's a potential there is just, you know, use the Power Platform SKU. You don't even have to necessarily talk to the customer, the, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, what type of license type or anything like that is because you'll just bundle that as part of your solution and sell them your, um, you know, line of business application for running a laundry service without uh, ever going near the, the first-party apps. Now, you know, I think it's interesting because Microsoft seems to have made a big, wide curve, but as you see them kind of coming back in now, and when you look particularly at Salesforce, you know, when we're looking at, at comparing like the force.com uh, development platform to Power Apps, and then you look at Microsoft Power Apps as an option, and sitting adjacent to that is the Office 365 platform with I don't know how many users at this point, uh, a huge a number of in, installed users of Microsoft products that bringing Power Apps into is a very simple process. When you look over on the other side at Azure and all the capabilities that you can tap into there is an ISV. So, you know, coming in that business apps door and having all these resources to the right of you and all these resources to the left of you, you know, where Salesforce really doesn't have either of those resources, I think it's a huge advantage for people to really understand, you know, of a built-in customer base. That, that's a good point. I, when you're an ISV and you're, and you're trying to make those decisions, have, have, have come, are, are you, do you find yourself trying to sort of walk, walk people through um, those elements of the, uh, of the decision or do, 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 come, do executives tend to already understand understand that or, or does it have to be sort of spelled out in more detail uh no i think they're coming in with those questions because frankly uh, we're seeing you know i mean office 365 has led the charge right i mean that thing has just caught fire e everywhere at every level of business enterprise all the way down to smb uh, across customers of all types and is still growing at a, at a rapid pace and many of those customers are using Salesforce, AWS, using other services, and then they're they're they're, they're using this productivity services and, and getting great value from those. And then when it comes to connecting those natively and easily with the other things they're using, yeah, you know, they're just seeing it's not as easy. And I mean, it's a grand plan of Microsoft that they've circled this big arc back around to where. It just, they're just making it too easy. I mean, if you're on Office 365, and many people are, it almost becomes a no-brainer. Uh, to, to why would you why would you utilize AWS or Salesforce? Um, 
if you're on this platform that those things kind of natively talk to each other uh, so easily. I think I think Microsoft is creating a significantly unfair competitive advantage out there that uh, you know some of the Salesforce ISVs are starting to recognize. You know, I think back to previous eras where um, where the dynamic where the Microsoft team run, running Dynamics had you know very um, very intense campaigns trying to recruit and um, and basically what's the word I don't want to say nail down but get commitments from um, from vendors who would com- you know commit to investing a lot of R and D to build on top of a Dynamics product either the CRM side or um, the three sixty uh, the 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 AX slash finance and operations side and to really kind of replatform or or sort of build a new flavor of their of their um, of their products on that. This isn't really like that. Uh, it doesn't seem and it doesn't seem like the push is the same from the Microsoft side. I know you mentioned uh, you know Stephen Guggenheimer uh, taking over some of the the, the app source uh, goals. Um, but are there other are other people at Microsoft that you sense are maybe pushing to pushing for the kind of recruitment um, that will bring in um, you know either new vendors or kind of reengage with the ones that have done done things other ways with Microsoft technology in the past? So you know, so 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 on that in that respect, like I've just uh, uh, the about a month and a half ago trained. Um, around 85 Microsoft staff around the globe, which are their sole target is to go out and acquire you ISV customers for the Power Platform. So Microsoft is kind of like, they're definitely scaling in that space at the moment. But if you like, we haven't seen the market momentum really pick up um, as yet, but it's definitely happening. There's definitely, you know, um, incentive programs that they're putting in place as we move into, you know, um, uh, calendar 19, and uh, you, I think you're going to see more and more rhythms. They're just they're, those teams are forming, becoming you know much more robust, making sure they got their go-to-market message from an I, for, for ISVs nailed down, and then also you know there's going to be things you know like licensing that's going to need a bit more clarity brought about. There's going to need to be the you know what are those big lighthouse customers that they're going to be able to you know claim on the power platform you know from uh, you know not using the first party apps at all. Um, I think we're going to see that momentum continue to build now in the um, in the year ahead. You know I think that also. You know, over the years, while Dynamics has grown, Salesforce has grown faster. So we haven't really caught up, uh, even with the pace of Salesforce's growth. And so some big changes really need to be made. And I think that's what Microsoft kind of put their head down and why maybe they got a little quiet on the ISV side was to go build the rest of those puzzle pieces to really connect all this stuff together to create this this pretty distinct advantage. And frankly, there's still some puzzle pieces under construction, but they exist. And 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 that I think is the key is that that this thing is 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 getting very tight now, very clean. The story's getting very clean. Uh, the the few missing gaps are getting plugged rapidly. And I think we're starting to see with Guggenheim and as as Mark said, them lifting their head up towards now going after ISBs with a much more robust story than they ever had before. And uh, I think I think you're going to see some some real noise and some real real activity in that space. Does that include um, things like uh, uh, you know, so the R and D, uh, you know, story around you know that this is not just a, a point and click, drag and drop kind of a platform. If you're talking about power apps, that that a real development team can can work against it. Um, that seems to have been one of the the, you know the the messages early on that Microsoft has been, I think, maybe trying to re uh, sort of re reposition that it's it, it, that it's a full scale development platform. Whether you want to do drag and drop, or whether you want to really write code the way you would with uh, with any other sort of either you know, Visual Studio or whatever uh, you know uh, sort of full you know, based what, app, uh, platform. I, I just saw in the latest Forrester Wave. Uh, uh, that Microsoft is now in the top right for uh, no-code development platforms. And that could not have been said a year ago. 
So they've invested heavily in enabling in customers um, to be able to build, you know, basic solutions, many of which they want to build on their own, uh, that they don't want to engage a partner. They don't want to, you know, invest in development cycles. They, they want to just have some sharp person on their team and give them the tools to go build some things to solve specific point problems in their business. And that whole citizen developer thing is a huge part of this story. I mean, when you look at where you where you as an ISV you can build a, a platform or you can build on the platform customer can build on the platform if they have development resources but then taking anything whether it's the first party apps whether it's uh, you know something built by an ISV and then having the end customer to be able to potentially extend that on their own to solve a lot of their day-to-day -day problems I, I think that's that's enormous. Uh, that's an enormous change for Microsoft. It's an enormous shift for the whole partner community to, to understand what that means. But I tell you what, customers are all over it. Uh, customers have never wanted to pay for development if they didn't have to. And now a significant, you know, uh, a chunk of that potential investment they had to make, they, they can now do on their own. And they can build stuff faster and, and meets their needs because the, the person who's going to be using it is building it. And I, I think that's just going to be a, a really huge part of this story as we go forward. I, I agree. I, I think the flip side to that, if I'm an if I'm an ISV sitting there listening to that pitch, I'm going to think, well, good for them. <laughs> so what, is, what does that What does that do for me? Well, 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 the thing is, is, is I don't think that uh, you know the citizen developer story is ever going to if you like, become enterprise grade. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you're always going to need the developer to take, if you like, what's been done and really stabilize it and turn it into a robust solution. So things like, you know, you, a citizen developer is not going to know the nuances of security models, for example. And there's there's elements that you could put in place and or if you like, um, fences that you could put in place to you make sure they don't go, you know, off the road, so to speak. But it's always going to need the more robust kind of thinking, I think, to then take what's been built to a certain point and really extend it, make it enterprise grade and and um, uh, make it a sustainable as a, a as a piece of technology that's been built on the platform. And I think from an SI standpoint, yeah, there may be a couple of things that a citizen developer will do now on their own that maybe they would have paid you to do in the past. But frankly, a lot of stuff they're going to build is stuff they never would have paid anybody to build. It's just stuff mm -hmm. they would have gone without. They wouldn't. They couldn't have justified the investment to to have it custom built. Uh, but they could certainly have you know Sally down there in in uh, in some department uh, build something on her own time. Um, and, and use it, uh, and that just makes the platform stickier. Uh, I think a lot of these citizen developer developed applications are going to end up being tools that the customer might start, and then as they become more important to their business, maybe they're going to bring the SI or the developer in to, as Mark says, you know, wrap the security model correctly around it or kind of refine it some more. So, I, I think it's going to be a wash. I don't, I don't foresee that that uh, SIs are going to sell a license and the customer is just going to go build everything on their own. Uh, I, don't, I think it's going to be a wash. I think they'll, they'll build a lot of things that would never have been built, which is good for all of us. just makes the platform more valuable to the customer. And I think some of the other things they build, um, they're going to end up bringing in developers you know, to help advance those things to the next level. And, and I guess this kind of goes back to my, my earlier question, but when you look at those those kind of more complex, more sophisticated um, capabilities that you would turn to an SI or an ISV to build out. Um, do you feel like Microsoft's actually is making the investment to support those kinds of, um, those kinds of, uh, you know, capabilities on the platform so that there is a role for the, for the R and D team uh, at an ISV uh, organization to, to go and, you know, really build those industrialized solutions? Yeah, I mean they're they're definitely not converting everything into citizen developer. They've they've added some new citizen developer capabilities, uh, but everything that was there and more. When you get into the AI stack and all that sort of stuff, I mean the pie of opportunity for developers 
is is larger now than it's ever been even if you took out all of the citizen developer stuff and continuing to grow I think the biggest challenge that Microsoft has is getting their uh, developer partner community up to speed with what's going on I actually raised that question to Gabriel at the pack about you know how are they doing on getting the uh, legacy partners, if you will, up to speed. Because, uh, you know, Mark alluded to ISVs building, you know, on the old version. Well, there's SIs today that are, are you know, signing up a new customer tomorrow and building something old for them because they're simply not up to speed. And uh, she says, you know, we, we're doing our best to make sure they're aware and they understand. And frankly, the ones that don't move along will be replacing with new partners that, that are coming in. So, if you're an existing partner out there and you think Microsoft is going to wait for you to get here, um, they're not. Uh, you know, they're they're going to recruit, and they're actively recruiting new partners all the time, really to, to fill the gap for this this large um, uh, population of legacy partners that just have not kept up. And and that's a real shame to me. I mean, because when you look at power, power platform technology, it is I, from from all I can tell fairly incremental um, in terms of the skills that uh, almost any Microsoft partner with business cu business based customers is going to I think you know skills that they would already have uh, knowledge and, and, and expertise they would already have so it's really, it really does seem like a, a shame if, if companies can't come along for that because um, of all the different you ways know, they funny. can move ahead. Yeah, you know, one of the things we preach to customers about is change management. You know, let's take your old processes and modernize them on this platform. And a big part of that that process is change management, getting you to stop doing things the way you used to do them and do them a new way that's more efficient. But partners suffer from that as badly as customers. You know, just mm -hmm. you know, they keep doing what they've been doing, and and change is inefficient. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop development cycles. I'm gonna I have, have, have my team what, spend a bunch of time to get up to speed. Nobody's paying me for that. As long as I got customers paying me, I'm gonna I'm gonna you know build what we know and tr trying to carve out that time or make that time for your team to get up to speed and learn what's going on is is not an easy thing to do and continue to make money. I mean, nobody's paying you to do that. But mm -hmm. if you don't do that, uh, you're suddenly gonna look up and you'll be just so out of touch that uh, you won't have a business anymore. So to, to a degree, I think it's it's also that so many of the ISV products out there are really come from SIs. So people at their primary business is implementing the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, and not actually they're not actually a product building company. So if you look at so many of the solutions out there, if you go and look at the nexus of them, you'll find that they are an SI company that developed some IP and built a product out of it. Unfortunately, they haven't, not, not all of them have gone through a mindset change and said, you know, this actually needs to be a standalone business with a robust R&D element to it, a robust kind of um, marketing model, a robust validation model, and a, a robust team to continue to develop on that solution. It can't be just people that were like hitting the bench in the SI business and we're going to tinker with it and do a little bit every now and again. It needs to be more kind of considered as, you know, uh, a standalone software development business that you're building. And therefore, uh, I think if that focus happens, if you look at the, the most successful ISV solutions out there, um, they're always companies that are not SIs. They are purebred product development um, uh, houses that, are, uh, you know, if we take like CRM add-ons, you know, got a long history now, 15 plus years in this space. If you look at people like Click Dimensions, etc., they're just dedicated not to the SI work, but to building the ISV solution. And I think that we don't have enough ISVs that are just doing that dedicated story. You know, I think it actually speaks to the larger story Microsoft has been telling partners for years now is you, you need to stop thinking about just project services and start thinking about building you know, recurring revenue with IP. Hmm. And, and I think a lot of partners have looked at that and said, uh, yeah, there's some wisdom in that, but I don't know how to get from what I'm doing today over to doing that. So I think a lot of them that start, just as Mark says, they'll have their regular development team when they got spare time, you know, go work on some, you know, some potential IP. They either never finish it, or if they do finish it and publish it, they don't stay on top of it. 
and app source right now is is littered with carcasses of uh, solutions that don't work anymore because the platform that they get installed on has changed dramatically and the ISVs haven't you know haven't spent the time to go back in and keep them keep them going and i i think app source is is a do for an enema yeah. Do you, do you know what I think would actually really tidy up at source is, is a similar thing that you get in other platforms like WordPress, where they have the last published date, the last date that the publisher updated the software. Uh, you know, that was actually prime time on each one of those apps. I think a lot of people would be shocked at how much dead wood is sitting in there that look like they're prominent apps um, but are not. And I tell you, you know, if I'm, you know, looking at my WordPress site and, and looking to choose a third-party tool to add in, one of the key things I look at, if I see there's been no development on that particular app for, mm -hmm. you know, 12 months, I'm like, mate, I'm not going near it. They've obviously yep. given up or they're not interested anymore. I'm not going to install something into my tenant that's going to potentially not work because um, it just hasn't, the code hasn't been touched for so long, you know. Security risks could, be, you know, potentially crept in over that time. And I, I just think that uh, at the moment it's a fancy catalog app source, but it's, it could be so much more if it was, um, yeah, if, if, a, if a, a bit more of a review and a bit, bit more understanding of how people are using it was carried out. Well, it was a hot topic at the pack uh, for sure that uh, app source has not really uh, reached what it was supposed to reach. Uh, a lot of the apps in there won't install today, and you think about a customer who you know tries two or three apps and they won't install, then they just kind of give up on App Source, and and, and that, that's not good for the whole platform. Mm. I just I just wrote a post some new tools that Microsoft has introduced for checking your solutions and pre-certification testing of your application, and I think it was discussed or at least considered that they need to rerun all of the apps in app source back through those tools which are modern mm -hmm. and just uh, you know remove the apps that that don't function and don't don't meet best practices because there's a lot of junk in there and and I guess the downside is that's gonna that's gonna empty out app source quite a bit which is not what they want they'd like to have app source to be full and robust to lots of great solutions but I think they, they kind of need to do that cleanse. Uh, to just, and then and then have a, a continuous cycle where solutions, whenever they come out with an update to the platform, all those solutions get run back through. And just like you said with WordPress, you'll see sometimes some plugin says right there, not compatible with your version. Yeah. And that would have saved someone the trouble of you know installing and having having it not work and everything else. Uh, and I, I think they're going to adopt. Uh, you know, believe me, Googs is going to clean this up. Uh, and that's that's one key area that he's going to spend some time time on because app source, you know, should just be a golden source, you know. Yeah, yeah. The problem is, is that you know, I think that tools like app source often get built by marketing, and they love to tell a story of three thousand, you know, uh, ISV solutions and you know four hundred ISVs are building, and the yeah. minute you go do that clean out, and there's only ten or fifteen. That, that's not a nice marketing message for them to tell anymore, but it's kind of like saying, hey, I've got a million people in my email database and uh, 990,000 of them all bounce, you know? Um, so yep. what? Like, you can say the good numbers, but at the end of the day, are you actually adding value, moving the dial, really back, yeah, adding value? And, and I just think that the you know, we've almost gone back to the Dynamics marketplace with AppSource now. It's become you know, that dysfunctional. You know, and, and it, it just can't. And they, and they know that it can't. And mm. I, I think I think we're going to see them rip that Band-Aid uh, because what's what's worse, uh, having a smaller number of apps available in the app source or having a bunch of junk in there that, uh, you know, customers go to and have a bad experience and then just dismiss app source. And then mm. once a customer dismisses something, it's very difficult to get them to come back to it. Yeah. And if instead, every time they went to AppSource and found a solution that worked perfectly just as advertised and was maintained and kept up to date, uh, that would be the go-to source for customers. And I think I think they're going to rip that Band-Aid and, and make that happen. Yeah. Well, you just create a new store and give it a new name and let a new marketing team... <laughs> I don't think they're going to do that. You know, you know, for from biz, for business solutions is one leg of AppSource. AppSource is actually its own team, separate from business applications. Business applications is kind of responsible for their door into AppSource. 
Um, but, you know, the Azure team has their own door into AppSource, and the Azure team is on fire. I mean, they are – AppSource oh, is an absolute resounding success for Azure and so far kind of an utter failure for business applications. But there's a model. I mean, they can see what's happening in Azure. They know what works. And there's a lot of talk about – uh, taking what works over there and and bringing it into uh, the business application side. And I think one of the things they're doing over there is some some much tighter policing of the quality of the apps that are in there. Interesting. Well, and that was my uh, that was really my concluding question. I know we're running out of time for for this episode here, but uh, but yeah, in terms of what uh, what Microsoft could do better, that's certainly a big one. Yeah, and not just something they can do better, but something they plan to do better. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there's there's efforts in motion to make that happen. It's you know one thing to sit back as, you know, outside the bubble and point at things that they could do better. Um, it's another that they recognize mm -hmm. and are actually taking steps to to make something better. And AppSource, really, the whole ISV story is being scrutinized right now from you know from top to bottom, and and every every bump, every hurdle every challenge you know if you if you really work the system well uh, Microsoft can make you successful if you've got a good solution mm -hmm. uh, that solves a legitimate problem and you've got it in the right places at Microsoft connected with the right teams you know Microsoft can make you successful that's not something Salesforce does that's not something AWS does that's something that as far as I'm aware of only Microsoft does They've got their own huge sales force uh, that is out there selling ISV solutions with ISVs into Microsoft customers. Um, there, there's the, the opportunity is huge if you if you build something worthwhile, build it right, and get it into the system, you know, in the correct way, and have the right connections internally. Um, you know, you, you could you could do very well in this space. So we are, and I expect other people will too. Great. Um, yeah. Any other parting uh, parting messages or, or, or places you want to note, sites you want to note, um, information you want to call out before we uh, before we take off here? Yeah, we will be announcing a couple of big ISV opportunities that Power ISV is working with uh, very soon. Um, Microsoft is uh, gearing up to start directing several of those incoming ISV inquiries over to us to to give them some help. That's uh, one of the reasons why we're not actually an entity but actually a, a collection of you know individual independent uh people because microsoft can refer to that type of a of a group where they can't really refer to a specific organization um and i think we're gonna we're, we're hopefully gonna help lots of isvs you know reach success with the platform and, and from my side i would just note um on november 30th we have an interesting very re relevant uh webcast coming up with muhammad um, mustafa um, another Microsoft MVP. He'll be talking about his experience um, creating an I a Microsoft ISV partner business, um, and, and and what he's been going through there to really kind of build one up from just using you know his expertise and his experience in the channel and and, uh, and working with Microsoft Connections. So I'm, I'm pretty interested to to hear that as well. And I think it's uh, again just on, on the same theme here. So. Yeah, Muhammad's a great MVP, and, and he's got a great story to tell. Great. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there. Uh, Mark, Steve, thank you both so much for taking the time to, to come on here and chat. It was a lot of fun. Pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon, Jason. This has been another episode of the MSDW Podcast. My thanks to Mark Smith and Steve Mordu for joining me today. If you want to get in touch, you can reach out by email, jgumpert at msdynamicsworld.com. Until next time, this is MS Dynamics World signing off.